Hello and welcome to the Recreation to Recreation podcast, the show where we explore the stories of people who have turned the activity that they love into positive change for our world. My name is Jen, and I'll be your sidekick on this adventure as we treasure hunt for gems of insight and wisdom while exploring the planet with our inspiring guests. For today's adventure, we're heading to Belgium and beyond, where we're meeting up with Haroon to explore his world of creativity, entrepreneurship, and embracing change. Hi, Haroon. Hello. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm well. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm great. Fantastic. So before we get stuck in to our weird and wonderful questions, I'm wondering if you can maybe just tell us where you are and what it's like there so we can get situated in your world. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I arrived three days ago with my wife in Portugal. So we're in Lisbon. Weather is pretty good, a little bit gray, but not raining. We're enjoying the local food and anything worth seeing. Beautiful. And you're actually from Belgium, right? I was born in Belgium and spent most of my life there. And we live at the moment in Belgium, which wasn't the case uh, not so long ago. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'm really excited to explore more. And before we get into that, I'd like to just ask you some weird and wonderful questions. Shoot. Okay. So what are the three most interesting places you've ever visited? I mean, the first that came on top of my mind is the Amazon. That was the place I I've been dreaming to visit since I was a kid. So when I got the opportunity to shoot a video there, even though it was uh, it was very low pay, it was for a friend, but I was like, yeah, I'll do it for basically anything. Yep, yeah, that was so different on, in every aspect and it completely lived up to, to my expectations. Uh, nice. you know, completely emerged in nature. Uh, nature reminds itself to you uh, very often by biting you, by making you <laughs> suffer, but you learn to, to enjoy it and you feel kind of one with nature. Mm. Uh, the second would be Cape Town, South Africa, which for some positive reasons, some less positives it's it's a very complicated uh, country as a whole south mm-hmm. africa uh, with a very troubled history but the people there are extremely resourceful the culture is very interesting there's a lot to see a lot to 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 soak in the, the place is also absolutely gorgeous uh, mm-hmm. the, the cape western cape gets a, a lot of extreme weather it has antarctica in the front it has the indian ocean on one side the atlantic on the other side it's really intense but it's super interesting the third that comes to mind is Angola. I went there to shoot a short documentary. And it's a country, again, it's interesting for positive and, and negative things because it, it came out of a, a very long civil war, not not that long ago. So it's a country that I would say deeply troubled. It's not safe everywhere. It's been pillaged by, by colonial uh, nations that wanted to, to get its resources. Mm-hmm. So it's very troubled, but it's a country with so much potential. We've met only only really kind people, and mm-hmm. um, but it has deserts, it has jungles, it has the coast, it has plains. It's it's incredible. It's an incredible country. How mm-hmm. many times have you sneezed in the last seven days? Hmm. Probably, I would I would say around maybe thirty times. Yeah, <laughs> rough estimate. Excellent. You know, your nasal passage just clearing itself out so you can smell all that wonderful (laughs) food that you are experiencing on your holiday. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Speaking of food, sweet or savory? Oh, that is tough. I love both pretty much equally. I would say savory because in sweets, it's mostly ice cream and and maybe cakes. The rest, I don't like like sweets, like uh, classic sweets. If there was a spider in your house, what would you do? Well, in fact, I love spiders, so I would definitely Perfect. not hurt it. Um, I would do my best to to actually, if it's a small one, I would just leave it where it is. If it's like a typical house spider, uh, they get rid of mosquitoes. They're useful. Um, otherwise, I would try to, to catch it and just throw it outside uh, so it can live its life elsewhere. Do you own a bicycle? I do. And is it good for, you know, cycling where you live? It, it got better. They are adding a lot more bike lanes. I'm guilty of not using my bike enough. Coming, we, we just came from four years in a country that had barely anything for cyclists. So my bike there, I never used it. And here I need to, to definitely make the effort of using it more. That's awesome. And sorry, where were you moving from? Uh, from uh, Serbia. 
Right. Okay. Well, you know, no pressure to use your bike, but it is a wonderful <laughs> way of getting around, right? Absolutely. And much better Absolutely. for the environment. So we can all yeah. be reminded to use our bikes and get yeah, a little bit of exercise. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's better for ourselves as well. So exactly. Yeah. Full circle. Win win. Mm -hmm. yep. And last Absolutely. but not least, when was the last time you stayed up past four in the morning? Oh, oh, that was a long time ago. Um, maybe it was actually New Year's Eve. Definitely nothing sooner than that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Well, you made it through the quick fire round. So <laughs> hopefully <laughs> you enjoyed that. I always yeah. do because you never know what you're going to get, which is exactly. great. Exactly. <laughs> I love quizzes. So yeah, me too. That, that felt like one. Okay. It, it's, Perfect. It's nice. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So now we're going to get into the good stuff. I always like to start with the origin story. So I'd love to know more about you. Where are you from? How did life begin? What's it been like being you? Go ahead, dive in. So I was born in Belgium. My mother is from Belgium. My father is from Morocco. Uh, he came to Belgium to study. And that's where my parents met. But my father uh, was an agricultural engineer working for the, the United Nations. Because of that, we moved abroad. So when I was very young, we moved to Saudi Arabia, but for like a year. And then when I was two, we moved to Oman uh, next to the, the, the Persian Gulf. I stayed there for five years. So wow. I basically started school in, in English, close to the Indian Ocean, spending a lot of time in nature. But after that, we came back to Belgium, but my father kept moving abroad. Uh, it still gave me the opportunity to, to see some other countries because after that, he, he was on a mission in Mozambique, uh, mm. just after the civil war there, and after that in Senegal. Yeah, I started my childhood in, in Oman. Then we moved to Belgium when I was seven. And from that point on, I lived in Belgium until I, I moved to Serbia, excluding all the trips for, for filming or for work. Wow, what, a, what an amazing diversity of places to grow up. They're very different. And do you think that's part of what's inspired you to kind of go on to do what you ended up doing? Oh, yeah. I mean, the life I, I, I had as, as a video producer definitely was a bit chasing this kind of exotic feel. And I was going to say the assault on the senses, but it's not, not that, but more mm -hmm. like the, the stimulation on the senses you get in, in, in those countries. Everything you see, the, 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 the culture, the food, um, I was definitely looking for any excuse to travel. That was my number one priority. Uh, often not doing works that would help me financially in my career, prioritizing those that would make me travel, for sure. Yeah, and then you certainly succeeded from the sounds of it with what you've ended up doing. So I'm really excited to delve in more. I'm wondering with regards to sort of filmmaking or even just more so in a broad sense and sort of communication of storytelling, was that something that has always been a passion for you? So when I was very young, I, I wasn't doing anything like photography or writing. I, I wasn't really doing anything, I would say, creative in that sense. I mean, very young. But when I was 12, I would say that the first thing that would fall in, in around that would be I started drumming. I mean, three months after I started drumming, I joined the band of people that were way older than me. At the same time, I, I started doing photo manipulations and working with Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, getting into basically graphic arts. But yeah, I, I thought I, I would like to, to use my own stock photos to then play with, the, with them in, in Photoshop. And that's how I got, I got into photography. So when I was a teenager, photography, videography, I really jumped into videography at the end of university. And what did you do at university? Something kind of un unrelated. Mm -hmm. I studied marketing, I mean, business and marketing, strategic marketing. Uh, so there was some, some overlap with what I, was, I would go on to do later. But yeah, on my weekends and on, especially on holidays, I would be going abroad and climbing with friends and sometime uh, shooting, shooting while we were climbing. And uh, went all in at, during my last year of university, I got a loan from uh, actually a, a, beer, a beer brand, mm -hmm. a beer company. They gave me a small loan because I, I was born in, in, the, in that region. Not alone, actually, a grant. And uh, my parents lent me their car for many months. And I, I went to, to Switzerland, stepped in the car and, and shot my first documentary. Went, went really all in. I have done the same thing in terms mm -hmm. of my projects and initiatives. So I totally get that. And yeah, jump um, in and see what happens. As we say, dive in at the deep end. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. 
and how nice that you had the support of your parents in order to do that yeah, as well. I've been very lucky with that. Uh, I've, I've never had to 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 like uh, fight with them about anything. They, they mm -hmm. always supported. Uh, my father was a bit more, uh, I would say, uh, questioning a bit more the choices, but he was never opposing it. It was nice. more like, uh, oh, you, you really want to do that? So do you, don't you want to join a big, a large corporation and find a <laughs> job there? Um, but he was never like trying to stop me. That's a gift. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fortunately, you had a lot of information on your LinkedIn, which was really, really helpful for me in terms of exploring your pathway so far. And it certainly appears that you are, I think I can safely say, a serial entrepreneur, that you've basically taken what you're passionate about and you've navigated change in both your personal and your professional life and, and really mm -hmm. followed that. And so I'd love to delve in a little bit more into what I'd like to call your sort of adventure story with regards mm -hmm. to that pathway we talked about earlier, which was this sort of going all in with regards to your filmmaking, going on to establish vast motion pictures. You went to over 20 different countries on four continents, so many different environments from mountains to rainforests, as we talked about a bit earlier, you know, working with some really big brands, Adidas and Mamet, and then especially this story that you had mentioned with regards to Vice and being with Alex Honnold and Stacey Bear in Angola. So I don't even know where to start. So maybe you can lead us through what that was like for you. I mean, coming back to the main point of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, it's possibly is more even at the center of what I have done than creativity. I've always liked to, to launch projects, manage projects, whatever it is. I mean, even in when I was a teenager, I worked as a as a student in a in a where you rent uh, DVDs. I started designing cards where you they would put a stamp for every rental you do, and then you would get a free rental at the end. And I designed them, and then went on to visit like 20 video stores to try to sell them the designs. So already when <laughs> at the time I was like trying to uh, get some income from my passion of doing graphic design. Yeah, I love um, that. I mean, ever since I got into video, I've been uh, I've been a freelancer and always trying to. I mean, I love coming up with a a concept and then try to to make it happen by by going to to brands or sometimes it was athletes that were contacting me that wanted to work with me. Mm -hmm. Other times I was contacting the athlete to get to be put in touch with the the, the marketing department to try to to convince them to to fund uh, to fund the, the the idea for a documentary. It started. Again, jumping uh, in, when I decided I was going to do video, I uh, went to the national championship of uh, rock climbing, sport climbing in, in Belgium and invited and, and shot the final and then put the video online, which got the most views of, out of any video of that, the, the event, got me views. Then I invited the winner, the national champion to shoot outdoors, mm -hmm. made that video. It was the first video in rock climbing that was using a DSLR. It was when there was the... Basically, the switch, uh, everybody was going from camcorders to DSLRs. It allowed oh, me interesting. to use yep. photo lenses and get a nice, a nice blur and like more creative angles. And uh, you could push the envelope on, on that aspect. And it's still now the, the, the most viewed short video of rock climbing in Fontainebleau, which wow. is probably the, the most popular rock climbing destination in, in Europe. And, after, and yeah, less than a year after that, I was uh, producing videos uh, for Adidas uh, advertorials because I contacted an athlete to, to shoot in South Africa. Uh, Adidas enjoyed the video afterwards. Then we did another one. At first glance, always going for stuff that would not work. It was the same in university. People would tell me, yeah, you, you, won't, you can never pass this year with so many exams to redo because I was not going to enough lessons, I must say. It was not very clear <laughs> at university. And they're like, nobody's has ever done it. And I was like, you have to redo 11 exams. I'll oh, see wow. what I can do. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I spent uh, one month uh, studying like crazy. And, and it, I, I like when people tell me yeah, that that's not going to happen. That's not going to work. Yeah, I, yeah, you can do it if you're committed enough. Part of what you were just talking about is something that is really important to pay attention to, which is people can always say no. There are people out there that, that really love that and are really happy to support people who are willing Absolutely. to sort of step outside their comfort zone and say, hey, I've got this crazy idea. I'm looking for people who are, you know, equally into, you know, doing things that are outside the box. And it's actually amazing when you go into it with this sort of willingness to let things happen, how often people will come back to you positively. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of people who, I mean, in any kind of companies will, 
well, actually excited to have somebody that's not the usual profile they, 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 they help or they work with. Mm-hmm. They, they, they like people who are daring, who, who are maybe a bit young to try to get this kind of project or to apply for this job. They like, like the, the, a, bit, a little bit of audacity. Yeah, you might be surprised. And anyway, if you don't try, you, you, you will never know it and you will maybe regret it. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's always worth trying. You, you learn to get, to, get, uh, to get used to the no's. People can have a lot of discomfort around rejection, mm-hmm. but I think when you're really, truly passionate about something, it doesn't really matter how many times you get a no, like you might feel it, but you get better at navigating it over time mm-hmm. because you gain experience for every 10 no's, there's one yes. And that yes is something that can completely change the trajectory exactly. of your life. And so I'd love to hear more about Climb Angola. From what I understand, it was sort of a combination of climbing and climbing previously unclimbed locations, but also had this sort of social responsibility aspect to it with regards to Stacy's work around finding hidden landmines and raising awareness of how those two seemingly disparate things could come together into quite a unique story. For, for me, it started because after shooting in, in South Africa and shooting then in, in Malawi again for Adidas, originally the shot in Malawi for Adidas, it was supposed to be a feature-length documentary. My, my family has always worked in Africa, so I, I was always very attracted to Africa. And I started scouting different locations where there could be unclimbed spots and, and a lot of potential for rock climbing. And Angola was one of the, the countries with the, the, the most spots. But fortunately, it, it, it shifted from a feature length to a short format video just covering uh, some locations in Malawi. But I still wanted to go to Angola. So I contacted a few climbers, including Alex Arnold. And I can't remember exactly how I was put to, uh, in contact with Stacy. On his side, I'm looking for an opportunity to go back to Angola to kind of explore it in a, in a different light than how he experienced it first, which was uh, in the context of the army. I would say the exit of the military was something that was quite tough for him. I mean, he, exp- he talks about it a lot. In, he talks about it also in the documentary. And he wanted to go back to locations, but doing something different, doing something positive. Uh, even though what he was doing in Angola was pretty positive. They were doing mine clearance already when he was there. But he wanted to go back and see it outside of the context of his time in, in the army, but mm-hmm. still supporting mine clearance. We tried to find, find financing for it for a short period. And then uh, through his contacts, we, we were put in, in, in touch with, with Vice Media. He proposed us to produce the documentary. And I was going to be one of the two filmmakers on, on the video. And then there would be Stacy and uh, Alex Honnold, who was also plan- planning through his foundation. Uh, he was looking for locations where they could work on flying people with solar energy. Mm. So it, it all combined together. And we went there for this trip that was basically to, to shine another light on, on Angola through uh, efforts to, to rebuild the country after the civil war, but also to speak the universal language of uh, sports exploration mm-hmm. um, and it was a, yeah, a very interesting trip with stuff that didn't work out all the times uh, how we wanted it a lot of surprises it was mm-hmm. uh, pretty crazy Absolutely. And I mean, I think that's a big part of any project where actually just any project in general, but especially Mm -hmm. when you're going to a different country and with so many different aspects to the story that you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, flexibility is key, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've forced myself to adapt to different conditions. This kind of flexibility, which I also have to apply to my work as, a, uh, I would say, marketing specialist. You have to adapt to the different industry, to the different client, the different people. I don't like being a specialist. I prefer mm. being good at adapting to different challenges. I never tried, made any effort to be like the best at one single thing. It's, it's just not the way I, I like to, to do things. And it's probably why also I, I like entrepreneurship and being a freelancer is you, you got to be at least decent and a lot of different things, uh, whether it's uh, managing yourself, managing clients, copywriting, the actual task that you're doing, in my case, marketing or content production, project management, you have to be what they, a lot of people call a solopreneur. It's really easy to kind of look at different opportunities and different jobs and say, oh, you know, like I... I don't know what I'm going to gain from this. Am I taking a step back or horizontal? And people can get pretty focused on 
careers taking just one particular direction Mm -hmm. and way of growing. And what I have always found really fascinating is reflecting back and looking at the skill set that you can develop in every different job that you take on and how those are transferable skills that you Mm -hmm. actually, sometimes when you find yourself in a new position, you can go, oh yeah, wait a second. I did, I did that at one point. And Actually, I can draw on that seemingly insignificant thing that I did or I thought was insignificant years ago and now is actually hugely useful to me. Looking at what you're doing now and then pulling on this huge diversity of experience that you've had by following your passions and being willing to sort of take the unconventional route (laughs) with regards to your career is something that I think is really important for people to keep in mind as they navigate their own journey. Oh, yeah, um, I absolutely agree. Like just ma- working with other people, you always build build on that skill, uh, communicating and whatever you do. A lot of stuff that, yeah, it's, it's very transferable. Just returning back to that point about flexibility, you know, when you're out in the field and you're filming and you've got different people with different agendas, what were some of the skills that you feel like you gained through those experiences? A, a kind of ability to work under, under pressure, of uh, that, I would I say, uh, problem solving, basically. You, you always have uh, unexpected things happening. I mean, that's for every job, but when you're on a shoot, you don't have much time to, to fix it or to, to find a solution or an alternative. So I'd say problem solving, the path I've, I've chosen definitely makes you good at it. Project management, there are a few things that whether you're, you're looking for, you're working with a client for, marketing, uh, content production, or even when I was uh, like a a manager of a startup founding one, being aware of all the different aspects, all the different things that have to, to, you have to work on for a project to be successful. This you can take with you on, on anything. It's something I've, I definitely have worked on. I think about all the different aspects of, uh, of uh, getting the the final result, whether it's selling a product in a startup or distributing a documentary, it's pretty similar. In, mm. in, in any kind of project you do, you got to have some notion of what a product is. How do you define, how do you, you, you create a product? How do you finance it? Or how do you, do you group all the, 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 the conditions or you gather the, the elements that will allow you to produce it? And then you got to sell it and you got to market it. It's the same. You do, a, you, do you have a nonprofit project. You still got to find people to help you. You got to make it exciting for people. Yeah, that's a skill I, I definitely developed through that. Uh, how to how to present a project and how to get it, how to get interest. Also, over the years, like so many different iterations of that same process, so that you're you're basically honing that kind of as a craft that mm-hmm. you can then apply to all sorts of different situations. Which we were talking there briefly about gaining support and collaboration. I'd love to explore a little bit about Motion Tribe. So this was a a company that you founded where basically creatives could access equipment across the world. They didn't have to necessarily have their own. They could rent it from other filmmakers and people who were sort of in the filmmaking industry, which I really loved because it can be very expensive when you're first starting Mm -hmm. out or if you're traveling across the world to take your kit or whatever the situation is, the concept of this sort of accessibility for people to be creative. So maybe you could tell me a little bit more about what led you to set that up and what that Mm -hmm. was like for you. After filming and producing videos in in many countries for a wide range of clients, I had a pretty good understanding of what it was to be uh, either a freelancer or working as a small company. And the idea is not ours. The biggest one was ShareGrid in the US, started in Los Angeles, which is of course the biggest market when it comes to to renting out equipment, video equipment. And I was amazed to see that it didn't exist in Europe, anything similar to that. So it's basically an Airbnb, the equivalent of Airbnb, but to rent out your unused video production equipment. It can Mm. be lights, it can be microphones, camera lenses, even a studio. Uh, All of that you can rent to others and get a little bit more money back on your investment uh, when you're not using it. And the extra thing was that we negotiated an an insurance product with uh, one of the largest insurance company in the world, AXA. That that was just for our platform. So all the rentals were uh, insured. The people knew that their equipment would would be covered when they rented to somebody else. I told my best friend that uh, I wanted to actually set it up and, and make it happen in Europe. And he was very interested as well. So he became my, my co-founder and we joined an incubator to, 
to set it up. After a few months, we were active in Belgium, I started being active in London. Yeah, I was very happy with the, the work we were doing on marketing. We were gathering more, uh, more members than, than we promised to our investors when we got our first investors. After a while, we, we stopped because the market just wasn't dense enough in Europe. So this is also something that happens with uh, in entre- entrepreneurship. Uh, mm. It doesn't always work out. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, we had a call with the, the CEO of the, the platform in the US, ShareGrid, the largest, still the largest in the world, he told us on the phone that he had no intention of going to Europe because the market was not uh, concentrated enough. The, the trust element that, for example, in Los Angeles, you would rent from people that you don't necessarily know. So you really want to have the insurance. But right. if you're in Brussels, it's that it's so small that, yeah, people would rather rent from friends, even if there is no insurance, because they, they are already friends. They right. already know them. It's such a small industry there. Mm-hmm. Uh, or they would rent from rental houses, because again, it's such a small industry that are very tightly, I would say, connected to them. We started launching in, yeah, in five more countries, actually, France, Germany, uh, Spain, Italy, and I think I'm missing one, the Netherlands. We looked at our numbers, talked to our investors, and we decided to, we still had cash, and we decided to, to just stop the adventure. We were very lucky. A lot, not a lot of people start a project like that and actually don't end up with debts or nothing or uh, with, a, with a tough situation. It was very, very simple. It's a part of what I wanted to cover today was the, <laughs> the realities of entrepreneurship. But there's so much that can be learned from each and everything that you do. And also the the connections that you make with people, especially across different countries, like you would have with this, the general wind up of a, of a business sometimes doesn't always go that smoothly. Mm-hmm. But as you reflect back on it, what are the some of the main things that you learned from that period of time and setting that up? It definitely gave me uh, uh, some perspective regarding some common uh, things you hear in, in, I would say, the entrepreneur uh, sphere, and whether, whether you're on Twitter or, or anywhere else where people keep trying to make the general public believe that it's only up to you if you're successful in life this is absolutely not true but the opposite is also absolutely not true it's <laughs> basically you, you have to create your, your chance your, your, your opportunities 100 percent of the people succeeded tried so you gotta put yourself out there and try you can make your the, the odds more in, in in your favor but i'm also perfectly aware of how of how lucky i, I was myself not that my parents had trust funds or could they invest money, or but I always had a place to sleep if I when I was bootstrapping for the startup. It's not the case right. with everybody. Uh, so right. I also discovered how lucky I was. I, I joined a good incubator. I also had a supporting girlfriend that would become my wife afterwards. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of elements that make it possible. That that I mean that are key to the success of any project. It's definitely in your hands. A lot of people I, I knew in video were not even contacting any brands because. They thought there were no, there was no way you could get a client uh, this big, this fast, or and they would like stay in the classic path of a, of a videographer being first a, a second camera assistant, then first camera assistant, then camera operator, then director, and they were doing years of that because they didn't, they didn't believe you could take any shortcut. Right. You can if you if you try and try, you you, you can do it, but uh, I definitely know also that you need the. Uh, there are a lot of factors that make it easier for you in life. You can't discourage anybody to attempt, but you can also blame any anybody that hard. You can't blame them too hard to to fail at something because some people are given bad cards. It takes a lot of effort to level the, the, the playing field. I think a lot of the times when we face really challenging things in life, when things don't go to plan and they, and I say fail in inverted commas because I don't, I don't really believe in failure as such. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's all just an exploration and we're all just learning and growing and expanding, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you're willing to look at it that way, it's just a shift in perspective. Absolutely. But willingness to look at things in a different way and also encourage people around you to do the same, you know, regardless of what industry you're in, there can be very, we kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier, expected pathways to doing certain things. And then there's the people that are willing to go out there and have people go, well, that that's never going to work. Or how are you (laughs) going to do it that way? It just comes back to that entrepreneurial mindset, which is, well, I won't know if I don't try. And 
also recognizing as you were there when we have those support networks that are really important and really enable us to be able to take those risks, whether it's, you know, family, friends, mm -hmm. your collaborators in your business and, and taking that time and that space for that gratitude of, wow, like I really lucked out with the life that I've been given. I'm very privileged to be able to do these things mm -hmm. and to have that safety of being able to venture out and try different things for some people doing i mean betting on on some i mean trying some stuff that i that i tried failure would mean living on the street for some people so i can't mm. compare my, my path with with others i mean yeah if i had gone into video and and i never found a client well i could always crash at my parents place and apply for a job in in a company or something i would have easily alternatives i mean i had a master's degree at that point so that's a very privileged position to be, to get into video when you have a master's degree in business and marketing and, and a place to crash. It's very pri privileged. I think it's important to realize it, to acknowledge it. You feel grateful and it's a good, a good feeling. Absolutely. And this actually leads quite well into something that I, I really loved when I looked at your, your LinkedIn, which was that you proudly listed, you know, being a full-time parent as part of your career journey. And so often when people are talking about their career, they kind of leave out the personal side of things, mm -hmm. but you can't have one without the other. And they are, I think, especially as an entrepreneur <laughs> in that choice to be an entrepreneur, they tend to cross over maybe more so than when you go for jobs where you more clearly delineate, oh, this is work time and this is this is mm -hmm. home time. You know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're like, cool, I live this 24 mm -hmm. seven. And so I just wanted to read what you had written on there, which is you only have one life, lowering work volume to spend time with our first baby, well worth the time. You actually took time off to follow your wife for her career and you got into woodworking and became a cordon bleu cook. So maybe you could just go into that a little bit more because I think that that is such a wonderful thing to be able to see on someone's professional profile. I just don't really understand why people leave that out. It makes sense. It's, it's LinkedIn. It's not, it's, it's not the main spot for that, but it's such an important part of life. The most important part will always come before anything uh, work-related family there's not even any argument to be to be held there mm -hmm. uh, so yeah i put it and also because it just was the truth after ocean tribe the startup it was so, so intense and we did uh, almost two years of bootstrapping one of the nastiest aspect of entrepreneurship now i'm dealing slightly better with it but it's uh, the separation between yeah, private life and work life especially when i was single because i had nothing to balance it I was always uh, in, uh, in work mode or not 100% into it and never 100% out of it. It, all, it was always this in between where you, you, ne you forget what day even of the week uh, it is. <laughs> you, you stop getting mm -hmm. answers to emails so you, you understand <laughs> it's, the, it's the weekend. That's really unhealthy. And of course, a, a lot of people who, I mean, who, are, who handle any project, they suffer from it. When we moved, that was the deal with my wife. We focus on the startup and when that is over, focus on for a few years, like it was a few years on the startup, uh, on her career. Something that's common in her career is to go on missions, uh, kind of missions uh, for a few years. So we went to Serbia. When we moved there, she, she was pregnant. So the baby came, I was dealing with uh, closing the chapter, the chapter of the startup. And I did have a, a lot of time to, to get into other passions, to also to fill the gap. Uh, one of them was uh, woodworking and the other was uh, was cooking and yeah I had definitely I was lucky to have almost as much time as I wanted to, to for for my son so that's again very privileged and as you took that time was that the break between the startup and then going into this sort of freelance work that you're doing now yeah because I didn't want to go back to doing videos the way I was doing it before uh, for one it's not easy to fill a calendar with that kind of work Kind of advertorial documentary work on the other side it, it usually involved shoots that were two to four weeks and i didn't want to leave uh, regularly my family so i didn't even really want to get back to that kind of work so i started doing freelancing for projects that i uh, i found interesting as a consultant i'm still now doing more and more i'm still in growing the the, the number of days uh, per month that i work as a consultant but yeah it was a transition into that and i think it's always nice when you can 
as we talked about, mm -hmm. the, the gift of that break to kind of reassess and say, okay, I'm going to take this time. I'm going to really enjoy being in the in-between mm -hmm. <laughs> while I figure this out and sit with yourself and say, okay, well, how is this going to work now? Our lives are always changing. They're always moving forward, especially when we sit back to look at how our personal and our professional lives can meld together in a little bit more of a balanced way. And our priorities change, right? As we find partners or we get married mm -hmm. or say, for example, one of your elders becomes ill, you have to take care of them. Like there's so many different shapes in which your personal life can change mm -hmm. and really demands change from a professional perspective. I'd love to know, as you started shifting into the more freelance way of working as a consultant, from the looks of it, it's been pretty diverse in terms of the businesses and initiatives that you've been a part of. So mm -hmm. there, um, there was sort of Yoga Live and then the world of Banksy. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit more about was it a similar sort of thing where you reached out to people like you did with regards to your filmmaking near the beginning, where you were kind of like, I love what you're doing and this is what I can offer? Or were people looking to you? It really depends on the client. Sometimes I was referred to by, by a, uh, a friend that is also a, a consultant and was working on the project. So that was the case for Yoga Live and the World of Bank Banksy exhibits. Yeah, I had, uh, I had this friend works uh, worked also on those projects or was in touch with them and he suggested me and then then we started yoga life was really particular because it was a startup where the three founders uh, didn't have any startup experience but had solid experience outside of startups uh in, as strategic advisors and they needed somebody to to help them with marketing but very quickly it was obvious that they needed a bit more so I became the manager of project after about a week <laughs> working for it. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it, it, it was a bit of a weird one because I was not the CEO, but I was the manager and I was working, the people that were doing the other things were the founders. So it was not very clear, the responsibility. So it, it was a bit of a weird one, but it was very mm. interesting because it was, again, a two-sided marketplace like Motion Tribe. You have the supply, which was the yoga teachers, and more like the classes that the soap, uh, yoga teachers applied. You had to both market to the yoga teachers, to, so they would use the platform, and then market the, the classes to the yogis. So yeah, it was an interesting one. It, it also tied a little bit to the climbing world. Some of the yoga teachers were climbers, and, and because it's, both activities are really linked to body awareness. If you're, in, if you're in really in a connection with your body, it, it really unlocks the, the, the practice. And yeah, it's very different. Like the one I, I'm working, the, I have been for the last year and a, half, and a half is very different. That is in the blockchain industry. It's completely different. It's an oracle. So it's something that's, it's not a weird thing. Like a lot of the NFT projects, it's not some kind of opportunistic project. It's really something linked to the infrastructure. It's uh, an oracle. So they supply data to different smart contracts and projects. So completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the moment, I'm actually looking to onboard new uh, new clients. Actually, we moved to Belgium only four months ago, so I'm really in a, in a transition uh, of getting back into into the city, into Europe, and uh, connecting again with projects uh, and and the networking in Brussels. So I'm also a mentor for uh, an incubator, an accelerator, the biggest tech accelerator accelerators in Belgium, and also did some videos for another for actually the biggest accelerator in Belgium. I just did a series of videos to promote the the program. Yeah, it's very, again, diverse. So producing videos for one, helping another one, doing marketing strategy. And before that, Yoga Life was being uh, the, the manager. So in the span of a year, it's a year and a half, two years, it's three very, very different things. Needless to say, never boring. <laughs> Definitely never boring. But boring can be nice. So you never know what I'm going to do in a year. Uh, maybe it's going to be to be an employee for the first time in my life. The only time I've been an employee was when I was uh, doing student jobs when I was 16 years old. Uh, since then, I've always been freelancer, which has advantages and disadvantages. Work-life balance being one of the advantages of not all, but many, uh, many jobs as employees, where you got set hours, you got weekends. That, that's also something maybe I'll do in the future. It's a, one of the reasons why I chose Embracing Change as part of the sort of title for this episode, because I think that when we put ourselves into a box and we say, I'm only going to be this one mm -hmm. thing, which has clearly not, not been the case with regards <laughs> to your career, that willingness and that openness to say, hey, like, 
Yes, I have been an entrepreneur the majority of my career, but I'm not against this exploration of being an employee and what that might look like. And mm -hmm. I can always change again and knowing that, you know, you're never necessarily stuck in any one thing and that every single pathway that you go down, you're going to learn something and have an experience that's going to help you basically grow and you never know where it's going to lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really know exactly what I want to do. I, I know really well what I don't want to do. So mm. it usually allows to cut stuff <laughs> pretty, pretty fast. I don't know if it was serious or not, but some friends when, when, when I was cooking were always telling me, uh, you should maybe, uh, you should get into opening a restaurant or something like that. I don't want to have those uh, late hours and mm -hmm. basically never see my kid soon, kids when they come back from school. I don't want that life. Some others might want, want that. I don't want it. It's not because I think I can cook well also that it makes me a good uh, restaurant uh, owner or manager. It's a very specific set of skills. The entrepreneurial side, I, I, I would have it, but um, managing uh, the staff of a, of a restaurant is, uh, is quite different. Operating a restaurant, you, got, you have a lot of uh, rules. It's very specific. So it's something that I, I, I learned with time is it's not because you can do something that you should do it. So each time I had a passion, I wanted to, to make a, a job out, out of it. And if, if I could make money out of it, I would kind of feel reassured. And then I would sometimes move on to something else. I'd be like, okay, so actually you're, you're not bad at it. This was kind of the test to whether it was design, video, freelancing, co consultancy, even, even cooking. If, if people were telling me I would pay for it, I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's good enough. Or the woodworking, like people, so people asked me to, to make furniture for them. And I was like, no, mm. no, no. I thought about it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult market. Uh, but it's something I love doing. Uh, I, I love to do. I'm not doing it uh, anymore. I don't have a workshop anymore, but it's, it's absolutely amazing. You have the material, working with the material, just creating is something I, I love to do. I, I love building, uh, even if it's something that people don't typically build, like their own table to cook their mm -hmm. own food. I wanted also to make, I'll do it at some point, our uh, old ceramics for, for all our plates, bowl, bowls and all. I want to make them. Mm -hmm. So I will just find some YouTube videos and, and learn how to do it and go to Puppy Studio and, and try to try that they allow me to use their tools. Isn't it amazing, you know, the world that we live in that everything is so accessible to you now. It's, if, if it's, it's something uh, of interest, you can type it into Google and then all of a sudden, you know, there's yes, so many different, <laughs> yeah, so many different avenues to learning it. And I think you made a couple of really wonderful points that I, I'd love to just highlight there. One is, when we take on different opportunities, learning what we don't want to do can be just as important as learning what we do want to do. <laughs> and um, and just being able to sort of reflect on all of the things that you've experienced over the years, as, as I do with my career. Wow. Okay. Yeah. No, thanks. But this part of it, I really loved. And then also when you love doing a diversity of things, it can be really hard to prioritize what path to take and what mm -hmm. to focus on. What I think can be really powerful is when you look at the diversity of things and you go, okay, well, I'm, I'm into woodworking and I'm into cooking and I'm into now pottery and filmmaking and all of these wonderful things that have been passions of yours over the years and continue to be. It's recognizing, okay, what's actually underlying all of these things? And you hit mm -hmm. the nail on the head there. And I'm, I'm glad I picked this word out, which was creativity, mm -hmm. is like, if you get to the essence of what it's all about, it's just creativity and wanting to create things, whether that's storytelling. Yeah, that, that's um, always been a, a, a passion and a focus. Like my wife mocks me a little bit when uh, I play or we play with uh, with our son uh, with Le uh, Legos before going to, to bed. And sometimes uh, when it's her turn, we alternate every day. Uh, to to put him to bed and sometimes she comes up and I'm still half an hour after playing with the Legos because I need to build something <laughs> I need to, I need to, to to create something to build something to test it's the same with the cooking I usually the recipes sometimes I don't even do it once I see the recipe I see the technique and then I will have to make it my own the first time I do it or the second time the latest I would I will change it and, and adapt it just take the technique out of it I tried to push it uh, in November when I, I invited friends a long, long time in advance and I made an eight-course dinner. It wasn't all wins at all, but, uh, but they were all my own recipes. And uh, yeah, I just find it fun. I told them uh, most 
of the stuff I never even had done, just the dessert I had done. Everything else was the first time, just an idea that I tested on them. Having children of your own or being uh, around, say, you know, friends that are having children, they remind us to keep that creativity alive. And I always joke, like, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> and uh, I think the important thing is to not not take things so seriously if you can and, and mm -hmm. keep that sort of not the childish part, but the childlike part alive, being forever five and always interested and curious to learn and to try new things. And you've clearly done that so far. And I'm really excited to see what's next for you, as I'm sure you are. <laughs> um, of course. One of the things that I wanted to touch on there was the mentorship part of what you're, you're doing now with iMac iStart. What do you think the importance is for you? Because I always see mentorship as a really nice way of giving back. So I'd love to hear from your side how you kind of made that decision and, and what not only is it doing for the people that you're working with, but what is it doing for you being able to reflect back and maybe integrate some of the lessons that you've learned over the course of your career so far? It's still pretty new. I've seen two startups uh, to this point, and I'm going to meet a, a third one next month. Some of the work I do or the, the knowledge I have, I should share without financial relationship or benefit, especially for really uh, young startups. They, they couldn't afford anyway a consultant or any, every penny counts and actually puts their project in danger if they waste it. It's, it's hard to explain. I, I, I always like to educate people in the sense that I love to be educated. I think education is the is the most important aspect probably noticed but if there's something i i, I like i will love talking about it mm -hmm. and going to details or yeah i just love education and mentoring is, is part of it and you don't always have the answers i mean most of the time you don't have the answers but mm -hmm. you're asking the, the right questions and that's sometimes as valuable for uh for a project you you, you make them stop and reflect Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you have lots of big ideas and you, you, you can miss in really important things because you're so fired up and you're, you're, you're so concentrated on your project that you forget the bigger picture. And as a mentor, you're basically more there to make them reflect and give them the answers. They, don't, they will come with specific questions, but they will leave with questions that we ask them mm -hmm. and that they should think about. Yeah, I think it's the most important part of the mentoring. It's, it's not an answering questions, then go f have classes if that's what you're looking for. It's all about reflection. And, and on both sides, right? I often mm -hmm. think, you know, when we find ourselves in mentorship positions, a position of sort of giving advice that's mm -hmm. asked for never when it's not, mm -hmm. is, wow, that actually, I needed that myself mm -hmm. to remind myself of the same thing within my own career and how I'm approaching my current projects. Mentorship is one of those things. It's a gift mm -hmm. that gives back to everyone because- There's, There are a lot of things you know mm. and you don't apply. And sometimes reminding others about it makes you realize that you're actually not applying it. You're just telling about it. It makes you also reflect about what, the efforts you're doing or, or how you, you are approaching those important questions. Well, this has been fantastic. I'd love to talk now about the cause that you chose for the recreation donation this month, which is Save the Children. So this is an international humanitarian organization that has been protecting vulnerable children around the world for over 100 years. I would love to hear from your side why you chose this as your cause. Kind of uh, brushed it a little bit before the education part. I find it extremely important. I think a lot of the issues in the world are caused by people having uh, lacking education or having been unlucky with where they were born or, or the, I mean, any circumstance of their, their, their birth that was not their responsibility. And this organization is there to try to level the field a little bit. One of the most important part of what they do is access to education. Anything that could help families actually send their children to school instead of uh, being forced to make them work or anything else because they can't afford it is a net positive. And well-educated people don't always turn out to, to be uh, more responsible uh, adults, but, but at least they get some more, I would say, critical sense. I don't know if it translates to English well, but... Yeah, critical they, thinking. Critical thinking. I always think it's a, it's more critical thinking is mm. a good thing. As long as it's being critical to be critical, to get <laughs> yes. others down, of course, uh, just questioning things and not taking things at face value. 
Mm -hmm. And And having that curiosity to innovate, see things Mm -hmm. in a different way. Broadening the the horizon. Creating global citizens who are able Mm -hmm. to, as you were talking about with mentorship, is always this ability to take a step back and look at the bigger picture and see how we can create positive change through the ways that we choose to spend our lives. Yes. Understanding context as well. When you educate yourself, you get a better sense of context of any kind of issues or question and take a step back and reflect it's a fantastic cause to choose. So thank you very much for doing so. And thank you for supporting um, it. of course, and so for anybody listening, there's going to be all of the links are going to be in the show notes. So make sure to check that out. And you can also visit the Recreation to Recreation Patreon. And Harun, thank you so much for your time today. I do have one yeah. last question for you. And you were prepared, I hope. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm asking everyone. And as we sign off here, and you go to hopefully enjoy I hope some sunshine in Portugal. Uh, I know it's cloudy right now, but hopefully it's sunny for the rest of your it visit. It should be good tomorrow. <laughs> and I go on an adventure to maybe go stack some wood for my fireplace here <laughs> in the snow of Canada. Very different. Yes, we are living very different lives right now, but um, it was great to cross paths today. And I really, really enjoyed this conversation. So thank you. Just to end on, what do you think is the meaning and purpose of life, the universe and everything? It's. I don't know if it's an answer that will really match what, what, what you expect, if you expect anything with that question. I have no is, expectations. It's, it's a bit linked to, is there a God? Is, isn't there a God? It's something that I define myself as uh, agnostic, but in the sense of not just that I don't know, but I, it doesn't really impact my life. I'm not sure if there is a meaning. And if there was one, what would it be? What I know is that there are very clear actions we can do to live better together to make life a little bit more easier for everyone. And those are the guidelines I, I mean, the things I try to, to apply to my daily life. Yeah, just to respect others and, and, and try to understand them. But the meaning of life, I'm not even sure if, that there is one, to be honest. So yeah, it's, it's a really tough question for me because the way I could sum it up is I do believe that people who will tell you with certainty that they know the answer to that question, those are people I usually tend to, to stay away from because I believe that people who, who really say that know it either are foolish or, uh, or, try, or have an agenda. But people who try to make you think about what it could be or what uh, involves the life, uh, going through your life, what is this crazy path, that is, is, is stuff that we need to talk about. But people who will tell you they absolutely know the answer, that is something that I have a big problem with. Uh, but people who think about it, I find it very inter- important. I do as well, but I, I really don't have an answer. And I'm fine with not having an answer. The whole point of asking that question is absolutely the exploration part of it. Mm-hmm. It's not to necessarily have an answer, but to just be willing to explore and experience and, and come up with your own reasons and your own meaning within your the context of your life. Really, everybody's answer is the perfect answer. I don't know if it's a meaning, but the way I choose to live life would be, and many people do it, it's nothing special. It's just uh, try to make the people uh, you, you love happy, trying not to, to walk on as lowest amount of toes as possible, not making life worse for, for others, uh, not going against my, my set of values. I would say not compromise, which would be a, in itself a 10-hour discussion, what is compromising, <laughs> what, what values do you have? Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's basically I just try to do that, but I don't have a I don't have an answer, even the beginning of an answer. I would say to to that, and I've thought a lot about it. But the more you the more you know, the more you realize you know little. So it's good to know the limits of your understanding, and I think you you define those limits more clearly the more you think about what you know, or you you try to answer those questions. So in that sense, it's it's so important. Just coming at everything with a beginner's mindset is Mm -hmm, the best way to be. And, you know, being willing to change. And as we've talked about with the the topics that we've covered today is just that willingness to change, be changed and be inspired by the world around Mm you. Stop learning. That's when you're really dead. Thank you so much for your time today, Haroon. I hope you have a most wonderful remainder of your holiday. Thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you for this experience. This month's recreation donation is in support of Save the Children. As you now know from exploring with Harun and I in this episode, 
they are a global organization that delivers emergency response, advocacy, and programming to put vulnerable children first. They are committed to helping children achieve their full potential through access to education, healthcare, food, shelter, and protective services. Whether you can volunteer your time, money, or your voice, we hope you will head over to our Patreon page to find out the different ways that you can support their unique version of recreation for the world. Please take the time to let us know what the stories we explored in this episode meant to you, and if you do take action to support this month's cause, thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Recreation to Recreation. If you, or someone you know, has a unique and inspiring story to tell, make sure to reach out so we can share it with the world. Until next time, keep happy, keep healthy, and keep exploring.